Now, if there is one gathering in the world that wouldn't need any convincing that ion channels are expressed in just about every tissue, every organ, every cell in the body, including even red blood cells that, that do not even have a nucleus, then uh, you, may, you wouldn't be surprised to, um, to see that ion channels are expressed in every cancer as well. So this, is, um, this shows the voltage-gated ion channels, various trip channels, even ligand-gated channels turning up in, in, in various cancers. So the question becomes, which is the cancer to focus on and how to go about making it clinically viable? Uh, and th these are the kind of questions uh, we are addressing, and I hope by the end of the next 20 minutes that I will have convinced you that ion channels do play a major role in the cancer process at all stages of this complex process, and they are targetable in a clinical context. So here is the plan of my uh, talk. Uh, first of all, I'll say some introductory things, um, what the problems are in, in clinical management of, of cancer, and then uh, discovery of voltage-gated sodium channels, eat specifically in metastatic tumors, and then the case for targeting the specifically the persistent current component of voltage-gated sodium channels uh, clinically, and then we shall uh, conclude. Now, you know, cancer is not going to go away. It's very much part of modern life. So back in a couple of years ago, there were eight, more than 8 million new cases. Um, sorry, 14 million new cases, 8 million deaths. So you can imagine that a country like Belgium or Greece would be wiped out uh, in a year. Like, uh, and and the, this is not going away. So it's, it's predicted in the next um, two decades that the, the the numbers will go up almost double by about 70%. So um, we need to do something about it because major problems remain in the clinical in clinical management of cancer. Uh, one initial problem is what I call definitive functional diagnosis. You may think you can walk into an average cancer clinic and, and have your tumor diagnosed. Far from it. We know that probably most commonly with prostate and, and, and prostate and PSA, prostatic, um, prostate specific antigen, very poor biomarker. And even when it is properly diagnosed, there, there aren't sufficient um, uh, therapeutic routes. And when there are the, the, the available therapies, they do not always last long and, and often are accompanied by uh, uh, undesirable side effects, toxic side effects. Of course, we are experiencing, as I stand today, the, the, the great excitement of immunotherapy, but that still remains um, to, to, to stand the test of time. In any case, it turns out that some of the immunotherapies cost something like 10,000 times more than the price of gold. <coughs> so, you know, we, we are up against a major problem. So our rationale here is to acknowledge that metastasis is the main cause of death in cancer patients. So 90% or more of cancer patients <laughs> do not die from primary tumors, this initial growth, they die when cancer spreads. And uh, uh, metastasis involves a dynamic series of basic cellular behaviors uh, in which ion channels are well known to play a role. So in order to, to, to invade, cancer cells have to move, have to detach, have to secrete, uh, and, 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 and so on. And we know very well from our basic physiology that ion channels are absolutely inherent to such cellular behaviors. So the question comes up, what are the ion channels involved in metastasis? And specifically, voltage-gated ion channels, because we believe in the power of the memory potential in driving ion channel activity. To answer this question, we adopted an electrophysiological approach, initially characterizing or profiling the voltage-gated currents in in, 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 a series, in series of cell lines of different metastatic potential, metastatic character. So here we're seeing, we're looking at, uh, at five different uh, human breast epithelial cells. On the left are um, benign, normal uh, ep breast epithelial cells, and as we go from left to right, metastasis increases uh, until we get to the uh, classic MDAMB231 cells that are well known to be strongly metastatic. When we, when we map out such profiles, and you can do this you know, using molecular biology, you can do an a subtractive hybridization or something like that and look to see how 
um, the different genes are expressed. What we see from these electrophysiological profiles, and we've done it for breast, for prostate, other people have done it for, for lung, is that as metastatic potential increases, as the cells become aggressive, initially the outward currents get smaller and smaller. They, so they, they seem to start losing their inhibition if we assume that out, outward currents would be inhibitory. And then eventually, um, we start getting the, uh, the classic um, inward current, which looks um, and, and confirmed uh, by pharmacology and molecular biology to be a voltage-gated uh, sodium channel. So here is a hypothesis. We like to, to be hypothesis-based. I have called this Selex hypothesis, Selex for cellular excitability. So what happens then in the acquisition of metastatic potential? The cells upregulate their sodium channels. These are all voltage Downregulate uh, their outward currents, mainly potassium channels. Together, the memory becomes excitable, regenerative. And, uh, and this is, in our vision, the basis of the, the kind of hyperactivity, unsociable behavior, invasiveness that, that we see in metastatic uh, carcinomas. I should emphasize that these are not brain tumors. These are epithelial tumors. So these are, um, in fact, I can um, quickly show you where this phenomenon has been uh, discovered and shown. We initially showed it in prostate cancer. Then uh, we and many others now have shown it in breast, in various forms of lung cancer, melanoma, cervical cancer, ovarian, colon, and probably all carcinoma. So we're looking at this phenomenon, especially the expression of the voltage-gated sodium channel. It's probably a pan-carcinoma phenomenon. Now, um, are we going to be able to target this sodium channel? Um, in order to do that, we need to know the, the molecular biology or its molecular characteristics. Like all multi-gene families, voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, of which there are nine or ten different uh, subtypes, they turn up in different uh, cancers with different subtypes. I want to focus on breast and colon here because the, the, the channel in question is NAV 1.5. This is a, the, the, the cardiac channel. When we do the molecular biology, um, it turns out that the channel, although it's a, it's a well-behaved sodium channel, NAV 1.5, but in its neonatal splice form. Now, uh, voltage-gated sodium channels are well known to be developmentally regulated, and, and often at exon 6, there is a differential splicing which results in several amino acids changing in domain one between segments three and four. And this is exactly what happens in, in cancer. And we have mapped out, mapped out these amino acids. There are seven differences between neonatal and adult, six of them in, a, in an extracellular loop, which is lovely because it means we can target the channel. Uh, and then there's a seventh one buried in the segment, which we tend to ignore. So the take home, first take home message is that this voltage gated sodium channel expression in metastatic disease or metastatic tumors is an epigenetic oncofetal phenomenon. So there is no mutation, nothing weird, which disappointed us a little bit in the early days because we wanted to you know, find some Frankenstein type channel in these tumors. In fact, it's a, it's a perfectly normal ion channel. The big difference is that it, it is epigenetic. It turns up in epithelia where it shouldn't be. And when it does, in common with many genes in cancer, uh, it is uh, expressed as an embryonic uh, splice form. Now, um, what about um, its role in, in invasiveness? Um, we, we and many others have done a lot of in vitro. I'll show you in vivo data as well. In vitro, we study invasiveness in a so-called Boyden chamber. So the cells are plated on a, matri on a layer of matrigel, which mimics the base me membrane. And that sits on top of a, of a micropore filter with eight micron pores. So the cells, in order to go from the top to the bottom, they need to digest the matrigel as they would in the, in the real world and then go through the pores as they would say when they go in and out of the circulation through the, the narrow spaces of the endothelial cells. And then we, we look at this invasiveness in the presence of various channel blockers. And then looking from bottom up, uh, we, you see this sort of view. And already, uh, 
here by blocking the, the voltage gated sodium channels. And of course, we are absolutely spoiled working with ion channels because there's lots of pharmacology, including some highly specific natural toxins. So we see immediately how blocking the channels with tetrodotoxin reduces invasiveness. And you know, all the statistics and so on come out nicely. And all these things have been done. This is all published stuff and so on. Now, the next question we asked is, OK, cancer is a complex process. Where does the sodium channel fit in the kind of systems pathobiology? biology of, of, of metastasis. Now, this question was answered by a group at Georgetown University on colon cancer. And just like us and others, they did uh, classic voltage clamp, um, patch clamp recordings, discovered the sodium channel in several um, colon cancer cell lines. And then both using both TTX and sRNA, this is colon is, as I said to you, is where NAV 1.5 is again expressed. Using uh, silencing of 1.5, they showed that invasiveness is reduced always by about a half. Now, what they then did, very cleverly, they knocked down SCN5A, the gene, of course, for NAV1.5, and looked at the network of genes that would control colon cancer invasiveness. Now, some of you may know colon cancer spreads. Uh, it's, 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 its common spreading target is liver, and once it spreads, it really is a horror, becomes a horrible disease. It's one of those cancers, if detected early, you can chop it out, reconnect, perfect, life goes on. If it goes to the liver, you're in deep, deep trouble. So uh, they looked at all these the digi genes that control the invasiveness, banged the whole data into a computer, and this is what they came up with. So there are five canonical mechanisms involved in colon cancer invasion, invasion, invasiveness, wind signaling, uh, all the proteases, proteolytic activity, calcium, MAP kinase, of course the big granddaddy of cancer, and uh, secretory mechanisms, and look where the channel is. It's the first domino. You know, it, 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 the, 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 the computer model says it's the expression of the channel that actually drives metastasis on. And it has been shown by other people um, that by just expressing the sodium channel in non-invasive cells, you can make them invasive. I can't show that. So this just summarizes that. So SCN5A, by driving all these so-called canonical signaling mechanisms, enhanced tumor invasiveness. Some people even say, I haven't had the, the, the courage to say it, uh, that the expression of the channel is necessary and sufficient for invasion. It certainly is a major accelerating force in cancer invasiveness. Now, this, um, the, the house model enables us to set up mechanistic models. I just want to show you that as well as, you know, um, doing lots of in vitro, in vivo things, we, are, we, we very much want to understand how the sodium channel does it, and we are pursuing various um, mechanisms. One, on the one hand, that there's a whole of the pH regulatory mechanism in which sodium hydrogen exchange plays a major role, and we're just beginning to work on sodium calcium exchange uh, as, as one of the key mechanisms. Now, um, all this means, and this has been a headache for us, we've got a lot of questions and criticism when we started this work, where does the sodium come from? Because our models always reckon, look, sodium has to go up for all this pH change and calcium to change. Because we all know that actual potentials only mediate picomoles of, of, of sodium influx and so on. The answer came um, when we thought a bit more deeply and said, what happens in cancer? What happens in metastasis? What is one of the driving forces? It is, of course, hypoxia. Growing tumors are hypoxic. So if you now revisit the sodium channel, let me call it sodium <coughs> channel, it's voltage-gated sodium channel, we can um, imagine that it has a set of, say, non-conducting uh, roles, and, and Tony Jackson will talk about that this afternoon, and then its conducting role, which we now, which we now can divide as being, uh, as comprising a transient <coughs> component, the classic, you know, action potential, <coughs> cardiac, da da da, and then this persistent current which is very, very sensitive to hypoxia. So this is a recording, not one of ours, um, I think Peter Gage. It shows a recording from a cardiomyocyte under control conditions. Here is the, <coughs> the inward current. Under hypoxic conditions, the, 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 the cells or the current develops this long inactivation, long inhibition of inactivation. In other words, the channel stays open for long. 
And this is the persistent current. Of course, growing tumors experience exactly the same thing. I won't go through this, but between, bless you, between, uh, <laughs> between inhaled air and tumors, there is massive drop in oxygen tension. And this is, of course, a trigger for angiogenesis. But the take, the, the take home message, or the message I want to give is that inside the tumor is hypoxic. We can see that this is a human laryngeal tumor. Um, it shows it's been it's a section a se stained with different dyes. In the middle is a necrotic region, so the, the middle of a l large enough tumor will will be necrotic. Cells will die. Even a tumor cell will not survive without any oxygen. So necrosis. Around it is hypoxia, the green region. So oxygen is not getting in. There isn't sufficient blood supply, and around that is where. The, the acidification occurs, and that, that is part of the proteolytic process. So we know that tumors are hypoxic. Now, what happens to the sodium channel again? So here we're now looking at, these are recordings from the Drosophila sodium channels. And again, this is actually looking at a, 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 this DMPK mutation, same phenomenon, just like hypoxia, that the, um, the, the, the channels Develop, develop this persistent current, which is due to the failed or prolonged inactivation, failed, prolonged failure of inactivation. And the channel just keeps reopening, even though it, it would normally close after a millisecond, and we get this persistent current. Now we know then how sodium comes in, and you can detect it in the clinic with MRI pictures. So this is a, this is a human breast cancer image with um, radioactive sodium in MRI, and you see as the as tumors become, as breast cancer becomes invasive, the, the, there's gallons more sodium in these tumors. So one thing you can take home, if you don't understand anything from today, is salt is bad for cancer patients. But you knew that anyway. Okay, now, so we are in a very good position now. Our hypothesis is if we can block this persistent current, we should be able to uh, stop the cells from invading. Now, we need to do that. There's no point in blocking the whole of the sodium current because we'll give people heart attacks and block their nerves and things like that. I should say, however, there may be people interested in this room who may be interested. Remember, the channel is, is an embryonic splice variant, which is different from the adult in several amino acids. And we have reasons to believe. In fact, we've made an antibody that distinguish between the two. And we have reasons to believe that, the, that those two splice variants are pharmacologically distinguishable. But I'm putting that to one side. We're putting the money on the persistent current. Now, cardiologists have come up with a drug called Ranexa. Gilead uh, sells it, used to sell it. It just came up patent. Now, Ranlazine is an anti-angina drug. And the reason why you get angina is you have some kind of ischemia in your heart. Blood doesn't supply, uh, doesn't flow properly because you, you might have had a heart attack, God forbid, or arrhythmia, something like that. In that, in that hypoxic condition, or ischemia, ischemic insult, exactly the, what I showed you happens. The, the sodium current develops a persistent current. That slows down sodium-calcium exchange, very important in heart. Calcium rises, and you start breaking up the cytoskeleton, and hence uh, have uh, heartburn, angina. Now, the way to treat that is to block the persistent current with ranolazine, leave the, the, the transient alone so your heart can carry on functioning, beating away, and you've prevented this overload of, of sodium leading to overload of calcium. So the question was, would it work in tumors? Uh, obviously it does, otherwise I wouldn't be dealing with it. Uh, now, uh, here is, we're now looking at a persistent current, okay? We forget, we want to protect the transient current in, in this approach. So we're only looking at the steady states. Here is, the black is normoxia. It's almost, you know, zero current. We expose the cells, so these are the, those human breast uh, highly metastatic cells, expose the cells for 24 hours uh, to hypoxia, no oxygen, or just bubble with, uh, with, with nitrogen. Uh, uh, either way, we see the, persist the persistent current develop. Now we apply it on the lazy, and there are other drugs as well, we completely block it. So it works. It works in tumor cells as well. Now we can put it into invasion chambers. 
Uh, we're looking here at invasiveness in Boyden chamber. The left hand uh, side are data under, taken under normoxic conditions. On the right are hypoxic conditions. First thing you see, and everything is normalized to one. That's the level of invasive, invasiveness under control conditions in normoxia. First thing you see is when you expose the cells to hypoxia, they become much more invasive. Now we apply TTX, tetrodotoxin is our gold standard. Immediately it reduces the invasiveness, just like we and others have shown many, many times. But look at ranolazin now. It really knocks it right down. It does work. If we do the same experiment on, on these MCF7 cells, these are also human breast cancer cells. They are non-metastatic, they're estrogen positive. Uh, it doesn't work. So they're, first of all, much less invasive, and neither TTX nor hypoxia, nor nothing, nothing works. So it is really specific for, for metastatic cells. Now, by, uh, by, pre by treating the cells, by pre-treating the cells for, am I running out of time? Okay. By, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I was having fun, Peter. <laughs> okay, we're going to wrap up in two minutes. I, I, you know, it, it's a bit like fish stock. The, the, the red light comes up and then, you know, you're, you're dead. Anyway, so my point here is that if we now pre-treat, not just do a kind of acute experiment, we can bring the, the effective concentrations right down to five micromolar, <coughs> six micromolar being the clinical limit. So we are now right in the, um, the, the clinical dose range. It doesn't affect, as I said, the, 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 the transient. So at the, at the concentrations we use, the transient is only affected by a few percent. And, and, and um, <coughs> that's it. Now, finally, does it work in vivo? This work was done by Roger, uh, Sebastian Roger in, in Tours in France. They induce tumors in mice. Again, this is all breast. And as well as knocking out 1.5, they it gave the animals uh, ranolazine. And look at the data here the invasiveness is hugely reduced. So it does work in, um, in, in vivo as well. Um, okay, I have a bit more data, but with all respect to my chair, who, who's an old friend, I will skip. Um, <laughs> so um, just to wrap up, the, the persistent current has other advantages. For example, it has a cardioprotective role. In, during, um, uh, during chemotherapy, the, you will know, you may know, the heart gets under a great insult by, the, by, the, by the, the toxic nature, and the, the heart can be protected by ranolazine, that's been shown. So the sodium channel has all the characteristics for being a wonderful prognostic marker and therapeutic marker in metastatic <laughs> disease, and, uh, and we can target it. There are, here are, are three independent ways. So we have the INAP blockers, the persistent blockers, uh, and we have repurposed ranolazine. Small molecule <laughs> blockers, exploiting the fact that the channel is neonatal, and we have the antibody that is also a therapeutic agent. And of course, the, the combinations of those as well. So just to conclude, finally, I think what we have done uh, over the years, which I tried to put across to you in this very short talk, is applying for the first time systemically electrophysiology patch cramping to cancer. We have made um, uh, the discovery of the sodium channel. Out of this has come a new concept, the Selex hypothesis, and importantly, novel clinical potential. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mustafa. I'm, I'm sorry to, to rush you. Uh, actually, for two reasons. Firstly, I really am sorry. And secondly, he's going to be chairing my session. <laughs> <laughs> so he's clearly going to take his revenge. <laughs> yes, question. Are patients with uh, gating poor mutations that have increase of persistent occurrence uh, do they have increased risk of cancer? Good question. I don't know. I thought you might ask me another question, <laughs> which I have an answer. <laughs> because it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. It, because many people take sodium channel blockers as, uh, as, as drugs, especially epileptic patients. So the question comes up, what happens to their cancer? But mutations in the sodium channel that would give rise to persistent current. So that would be very nice to look into. We didn't, I didn't think of that, actually. If you, if you have a, if you could help us, you know, would be great. Yes. I, I noticed that ranolazine has an asymmetric center. Uh -huh. 
So do you happen to know if plus and minus renolazine have different potencies on the <coughs> laser sodium current? Okay, excellent question. I don't know. We've just taken renolazine off the shelf. We are interested in making novel uh, analogs and novel inhibitors of the first system current. Maybe there will be one way of tweaking the uh, that, that molecule. Maybe, uh, maybe Bernardinelli at. Um, yes, we uh, know this name. You, you, know, you well. know the gentleman, Louis. Yes, yeah, you, you know him as well? Uh, not very well, but. Uh, okay. Uh, now, we, are, we, are, we have corresponded. We're trying to get okay. Gilead interested. <laughs> Uh, uh, I have to have a couple of drinks before I can open up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 very, it's been very interesting for me as a, you know, I'm a, a, a classic academic at Imperial College dealing with the, the commercial world. Has been very it was one of a series of compounds, so they will yeah. have other analogs yes. as well as the isomers. Okay, one more. <coughs> The idea is very nice, and obviously you've got quite a lot of evidence. The question always is, what is the black box between ion channel activity and cell liberation? And although you've shown, when you sh do analysis of gene expression data, you will see a large number of the, the usual target, you know, suspects like wind and yes. kinase. So the question really is, how does the effect of the channel activity Transduce to self liberation. Okay, well, I, I didn't mention that, but this channel is not involved in proliferative activity. If you're interested in, because uh, we are specifically interested in metastasis. But uh, metastasis is related to proliferation. No. There is good evidence that meta proliferation and metastasis can occur independently, and even in the clinic. There is, there is the phenomenon of, phenomenon of non-identifiable primary tumor, especially in aggressive cancers like small cell lung carcinoma. You have metastases and you don't know where the, the tumor is, it, it moves so fast. And people have, this is not our data, people have looked at the molecular biology of primary tumor joint <coughs> versus metastasis. And there are some mutually excluded genes that drive both. Now, and are they excluded in your analysis? Well, yes. So, by the sodium channel driving invasion and not proliferation fits in with that. Now, if you're interested in the ionic control of proliferation, then it's potassium channels that do it. But it seems, according to our thinking, our vision, is that when, it, when, when the cell needs to metastasize and it needs to upregulate the sodium channel, it actually lets go of the potassium channels, downregulates them, which means because proliferation is no longer an issue at that point. Obviously, the cells need to re-proliferate re when they reach their target, which is why I made the point that the cancer process is very, very dynamic. You know, different things will happen at different stages, including as regards ion channels. <coughs>